When it comes to picking colors, sometimes the colors you leave out are just as important as the colors you end up choosing. Let's find out why. I'm Abby Esparza with Photomanipulation.com and today we're continuing our journey into color. In part one we talked terms and phrases, but now it's time to figure out how they actually function together when choosing colors. So here's the color wheel, a handful of color combos, uh, go make your colors better. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and I think there's a button you're supposed to smash or something. Whoa, 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 you're kind of totally correct, kind of. Ignoring my bad attempts at jokes, we're going to cover actual tools and both for color palette picking and color creating and color matching, but before all of that, let's address the circular rainbow elephant in the room. The color wheel is and isn't important. Uh, artists don't use the color wheel. I mean, some might, but most don't. What they use or learn are color harmonies. A quick summary. Color harmonies are a set of rules of matching colors that look good together and will help you from choosing colors that don't look so good together. If you ever looked at an image and wondered why it just kind of looks bad, it's probably because the color harmony is off, like a person singing slightly off key. Color harmonies basically let you pick one color that you like and let science do the rest. And that one color is what we refer to as a key color. Again, we already covered this in the first video, but very briefly, a key color is the main or dominant color in an image. Now, as photo compositors, we're in a unique position. Like painters, we can choose our key color first and bash all other colors into submission, or add a color that didn't exist beforehand. In Lollipop, I wanted red to be the key color, a color while in the original stock image wouldn't have been considered its key color. However, it can also be a good idea to choose a color that does already exist within your main stock photos, especially if you have a, a specific portrait or subject in mind. In Starry Eyed, the main subject already had the pastel pinky purple I ended up using as my key color. Fighting the original photo's colors isn't always ideal compared to enhancing what's already there. Just like renovating a house is easier than knocking one down and building a whole new one. But both are equally valid options. Just something to keep in mind. Finding a key color is simple. If the key color is the most dominant color in an image, then it's going to usually be the first color you notice in that image. The key color is going to show up even in the shadows that might look black or the highlights that look white or gray. Use the color picker and keep an eye on the hue that is popping up the most. In photo compositing, you can do this before color correcting the image. That way your color grade will be more informed and you're not just winging it and hoping things turn out in the end, aka my personal worst habit. Once you've chosen or found your key color, now it's time to choose a color harmony. There are a number of different color harmonies. I'm going to focus on the four I feel are the most common. Also keep in mind, when looking at a photo I haven't made personally, I am more or less taking an educated guess at the color harmony and the key color. So direct complementary colors are the ones which sit completely opposite one another on the color wheel. A lot of complementary colors are already taken by popular culture. Christmas with red and green, orange and blue in every movie poster ever for a while there. This isn't to say red and green are off the table because Christmas, just that you might have to be a bit more aware of a color combo's a cultural associations, especially if that culture is popular within your own culture. Let's talk warm and cool colors. Warm and cool hues tend to be very complementary. 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 I can't say this. Complementary. Complementary. Now I'm just getting worse. Because of this, complementary color harmonies have more wiggle room. Let's take this image for example. It's a finished color graded image from Adobe Stock. I consider this a finished photograph. Right off the bat, I consider the key color to be this cyan color because it's the most dominant color of the image. I look at this image and I see aqua um, and lots of it. Complementary. 
complementary colors. Next, the color harmony is direct complementary. It's easy to spot as there is only one other color in this image, uh, this red dress. But if we look at my color wheel here, it's not adding up. For this to be considered a good color harmony, this dress needs to lean more orange. But yet these colors work together. So I guess everything is a lie. Let's end the video here, right? Remember, cool and warm tones are inherently complementary. And while this red color is really pushing into purple, I still consider it a warm color, especially when compared to the cyan blue. This is because there are also warm and cool versions of every color. Keep an eye on the amount of red shown here. We have cool blues and warm blues, cool reds and warm reds, cool yellows and warm yellows. Warm versions of cool colors have more red, while their cooler counterparts have less than either more green or blue. Color harmonies are guidelines, not rules. This cool red is still warm, and isn't that far off from the red leaning orange the wheel suggested to us. Now we talked about luminosity, aka lightness, and just exactly what it is in part 1, and we're going to talk about it even more coming up. However, let's get a little taste of it now. Here we have the cool red of the dress, and a warm red that is the same brightness, which is different from lightness, as the cool red. Then we have a swatch of the cyan aqua water. Now shifting the dress warmer would put us closer to the direct color harmony. Warm red is closer to orange. And the two reds are borderline identical, very little separation between the two. This might compel you to shift the dress to a warm red, or even more likely, might question if the magenta-ish dress is correct. But it's a not a magenta dress, it's still a red dress. It just leans cooler. Look what happens when you strip away the colors and leave only the lightness values. The cool red and warm red becomes distinctly different, where before they almost blended together. And more importantly, the cool red offers way more contrast to the aqua than the warm red. Remember, these colors are only different in terms of hue, their saturation and brightness are the same. So the cooler red and aqua are very close to the color harmony suggested, are a paired warm and cool color, and have good color contrast. That is why these colors work. Moving on to analogous colors. I'm going to say analog, even though you guys are very nice about not making fun of the way I pronounce things uh, most of the time. Colors which sit next to each other on the color wheel are known as analog colors. They'll have one dominant color, your key color, in common. Analog colors are often found in nature. Think of a forest, whole lot of different shades of greens and yellows. When creating a landscape, whether it be a matte painting or background, keeping to an analog color scheme will help keep things looking natural. Even if you're using an unnatural color palette, say a purple forest. Keeping the whole image to an analog color scheme will help it look like an actual purple forest, as if in this world their forests are purple like ours are green. It helps sell the story. The purple may not align with our technical reality, but the color scheme of a forest being mostly one color does. Analog colors also work great for portrait backgrounds. By having similar colors in the background, the subject remains the focus. Analog colors are similar to each other, but not the same like in a monochrome color harmony. Monochrome refers to anything which uses solely one color value. When you see an image that is overwhelmingly one color, you can consider it monochrome. Think shades of. Shades of blue, shades of red, uh, shades of green. A monochrome image doesn't have to be literally monochrome. It's more a, all I see in this image is blue. If there is some purple mixed in with that blue, then it would be analog. Here is a great example. You may not instinctively call this image monochrome, but all there is is red. Here is another example. All you see is red. Same here, blue, and then white and some black. All three images can be considered a monochrome color harmony, but what about black and white? Let's put a uh, pin in that for now. First, let's finish off our color harmonies with the triadic colors. The triadic or triad color harmony uses three or more colors spaced evenly in the points of a triangle, hence triadic. Triadic color harmonies are often vibrant due to the spacing of the colors. When it comes to the triadic color scheme, the key color doesn't matter as much, as you almost end up with three different key colors. 
Only almost though, your image still will have a key color, and that color will still remain the dominant color, just not as obvious as the other color harmonies. I'm quite partial to the triadic color scheme. It's a good way to be able to play with multiple colors, but still end up with a very cohesive color palette. Now let's talk saturation. We already covered what it exactly is, but how does it play a part in our color harmonies? I think something that tends to throw people off when using a color wheel is that you put in a key color, choose the harmony, and go, well, there's my palette. I guess I'm supposed to fill this image with eye-burning full saturation hues. That's what the harmony says. That's what it spat out at me. But of course that doesn't make sense. So you actually just sat there going, this doesn't make sense. I'm just going to go back to winging it. When a color wheel offers you a color harmony, it's only offering you hues. I mean, it's technically offering you other things, but what we're going to focus on, and what you're going to focus on, are the hues. You'll then take these hues and adjust them to create a more cohesive color palette, tinting, shading, and toning them. A bad habit I tend to spot is the oversaturation of colors as a way to quote unquote fix uh, muddy colors. You want to avoid oversaturation. Bold colors compete with each other and offer less color contrast. When every color is screaming, look at me, you're just going to opt to look away instead. And even further, things don't even have to be saturated to look vivid. Color harmonies, other colors, can complement and bring out the best in each other. This image looks vivid, yet if we look at the colors using the color picker, we can see the saturation is not all that high. Making something more vivid does not equal jack up the saturation. In fact, in landscapes or in any figurative work that features a lot of uh, natural elements, high saturation can look unnatural in an uncanny valley sort of way. Humans are very, very, very good at spotting unnatural green colors, given we have spent literally thousands of years looking at it in nature. So your general process is going to be first picking your key color, uh, then your color harmony to select your secondary hues, then adjusting color saturation so that you end up with a color palette where each color plays off and supports each other. Which brings us to our neutral colors. Our neutral colors are black, white, gray, and usually brown. These are basically supporting colors. Not always, for instance, in a black and white monochrome image, black, white, and gray are the color palette. And if you shade that image with brown, then that would be a brown monochrome color palette. And brown can absolutely be included in your color harmony as a main color. Just generally speaking, black, white, gray, and brown, like skin tones, will be there to support your main color scheme. They're the skeleton that you then throw a fun tie-dye shirt on. And that'll wrap up the color harmonies. If you're looking for somewhere to start, analog and complementary colors are typically the easier color harmonies to grasp. Think less is more. The more colors, the harder it is to get them to kind of work together. Lean on the color harmonies and learn from them. That's why they're there. Invented by some nerd, probably. I don't know. Color contrast and color weight. So we already touched a bit on color contrast. Color contrast comes from a color's lightness value. And say it out loud with me, lightness is different from brightness. The value of a color, lightness, is just as important as the color itself because of color contrast. Why is that, you ask? Color contrast divides an image and helps your eyes move through the image by adding depth and a visual path to follow. Lack of color contrast is just that, no contrast. This is how your image becomes lost, messy, or muddy. Low contrast makes images hard to see or experience. As photo compositors, we tend to have this idea that contrast is just light and lighting. Or even worse, that it's just jacking up the highlights and crushing the shadows. Whether you're using curves or levels or brightness contrast, we kind of get it in our heads that this is where contrast comes from. I mean, it's in the name of one of them, right? But values are what matter. So the next time you have that urge, stop and look at your colors and values instead. The best way to check your values is by looking at your colors in grayscale. And don't worry, stick around, I'm going to have a really, really great free tool for doing just that. And if you like what you're getting so far, it would mean a ton if you could let me know with a like or a comment, subscribe if you're not. Um, you really are the wind beneath my wings. <laughs> now, color weight, which is really just another term for color contrast. 
Determining a color's weight can help you determine a good color pairing. It'll also help establish a visual hierarchy. Colors have their own inherent visual weights. Yellow is a naturally lighter color, while blue and red are considerably naturally heavier. Guess which one looks darker when turned grayscale? Darker colors in general are perceived as heavier. The more shade a color has, the heavier it appears. The more tint a color has, the lighter it appears. And the more saturated a color, the heavier it appears. How do we apply this to our images? Well, heavier colors demand attention, and heavier colors oftentimes will seem closer to the imaginary lens. Something far away will be lighter in saturation um, and tint, and thus lighter in value. This is also called atmospheric perspective. From here, it really starts to get into lighting, so we're going to pull back a little bit, but still go into the relation between color and light specifically. Because here's the thing, light and color are completely entwined. However, I want to keep them separate, or as separate as possible, for the sake of clarity. We're at a fork in the road and we're going to take the left trail, but one day we'll double back and go right. But today is not that day. So light reacts to color by affecting its warmth as well as its lightness value. When light hits a color, it's normally warmer. Cool colors are normally displayed in shadows. Even if a shadow seems red, it may actually contain a lot of blue. So the red remains red, but it's a cool red versus a warm red. Or it can cease being red altogether and be a straight up blue, creating a more dramatic effect and a higher color contrast. Combining warm colors in front of cool colors is a great way to create depth. Shadows will also typically be desaturated while lighter areas will have a higher saturation. Shadows and highlights are rarely ever pure black or pure white. Using black as a shadow is how you end up with muddy looking colors. Adding warm on warm colors is also another way your colors will appear muddy. A warm color with a cool shadow will have more depth and clarity. If you have an image full of one color, that's great. You just use the warmer versions of the color in tandem with the cooler versions of that same color. This also doesn't mean that highlights are pure hues. The hotter the highlight, the higher the lightness value. The more the highlight will be tinted. Tinting is adding white to a hue, adding white desaturates a color. So when adding shadows, stay away from blacks and grays, and when painting highlights, stay away from pure hues and pure white. Keep your shadows cool and your highlights warm, generally speaking. Let's wrap things up with a couple of tools that'll help pick and create your color palettes. The color wheel I've been using throughout this video is the free built-in Adobe Color Themes, found by going into Windows, Extension, Adobe Color Themes. Using the eyedropper tool, color pick the key color of an image, or just change the foreground color to whatever key color you'd like it to be. Uh, select the middle color with the white arrow. This is our key color slot. Now hit the set selected color icon. The supporting colors will change according to whichever color harmony you've selected. Photoshop calls these color rules. Select the color rule icon to change your color harmony. Photoshop has the four we covered today, as well as a couple more. Once you have your key color, a color harmony, and a palette that looks like a pretty good starting point, don't forget to adjust uh, your saturations, I'd switch over to custom. This way you can tweak the hue slightly if you need to. Remember, a color harmony is a guide, not a rule in fact. A park, not a prison. Don't stray too much and you'll still be within the color harmony, and you'll be fine. You can also save your themes, turn them into swatches, and all that good stuff. Adobe Color is the web version of the extension, essentially, with a few more features. It can extract a theme from a pre-existing image, uh, grabbing colors for you, as well as extracting a gradient which can be useful for color grading. They have a trends page as well so you can see other color palettes, see which work, and maybe try to figure out why they work. The more you think about color, the better you'll get at color. Now, Colorist is a premium alternative to the Adobe Color Wheel. Premium as in, it'll cost you, but it's very affordable and they do offer a 15 day free trial. It's also immensely popular and for good reason, I definitely suggest grabbing it. In fact, I'll be talking much more about it and putting it to use in part three of this color series. Lastly, our very own Clinton Lofthouse has an amazing action that'll help guide you in both color and values. 
The action is 100% free, super easy to use, and gives you a set of color and value checker layers that'll help you apply all of the rules you learn today, making things much less nebulous and takes the theories and turns them more practical. And of course, there is a whole video on how to use them. Let's recap. Color harmonies are a set of guides that'll help choose colors that'll pair well together. These color harmonies are guides, not rules, and before choosing your color harmony, you choose your key color. The key color being the most dominant color in your image. Saturation matters, and something can be vivid without technically being saturated. Blasting everything with a dose of saturation does not a vivid image make. Lightness values and color contrast are incredibly important. Your color value is in a way more important than the color itself. Values are everything. Contrast doesn't mean jacking up the highlights and crushing the darks. Light and color are directly related to each other. Learning light means learning color and vice versa. And things are hard before they are easy. There is a learning curve to color. I'm still learning it, but it really does beat just crossing your fingers and hoping for the best. In part three of Color Theory, a photo manipulation guide, we'll be putting all of this and part one to use. Covering color grades, color matching, choosing stock, choosing settings, tools, the fun stuff. In the meantime, try going back through your old images, see if you can spot any successful color harmonies, even if they were accidental, aka me. You can even try reworking the colors using the tools and tips learned today. Or check out some of your favorite artists and see if you can backwards engineer their color choices. That's an amazing way to sharpen your color skills. Watching part one of this video series is also a great way to brush up on your color theory knowledge. But I know you already watched it, right? I mean, you wouldn't watch part two without watching part one. That would be crazy. I'm Abby Esparza with PhotoManipulation.com. See you in part three.